Here we are, now, with another episode of the Andrew Lake Podcast. My name is Dosta, and today I would like to talk about heavy words. I'd like to breathe significance into some words that mean a lot to me, as I am now, considering recent experiences of mine. And I'd like to do this to illustrate to you a way of meaning building. And before I actually get into the words themselves, or should I say the significance of the words, I think I just sort of like to lay out a bit of the structure around what I'm talking about. A little bit of the mechanics, the mechanics of meaning, the mechanics of experience the mechanics of significance. And there's a curious thing in paradoxical being, which is that when you realize a paradox, you have both sides of it. And I've mentioned this before. And how that applies to what we're talking about today is the meaning of words. And a paradoxical, fully realized experience of words has both extremes of meaning. And that means, on the one hand, words don't mean anything. Words are just blubbering sounds. Blubber, 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 chatter, 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 chatter. They're completely hollow. Totally meaningless. And all words are such. And then, on the other end of the extreme, every single word has a profound depth to it. Every word is soaking in truth. Every word is significant. And of course, as well as these two extremes, there are things in between. So there are inflections. There is, there is still a spectrum. It's a paradox on a paradox that things are polarized and also the spectrum remains. Which means that some words are sort of just still mundane. Some words are just whatever. Some words are boring. Some words are just meaningless in the normal sense, not in an existential sense or an absolute sense. And then there are still words that are very significant. And these words I am calling today the heavy words. And a heavy word is just the thing that you say that is most significant. A word that has an impact on you. And this spectrum, and also this polarization, occurs in each and every one of us, structurally, but the content is different for each of us. And what's most significant for me varies not only in the words 
and what the words represent, but also in intensity. And how many gradations there are within the spectrum and what sides of what is significant or insignificant and how often they come up and their different amounts to them is different between us. Because we can always say, well, we both have that gradations, but the question is, which? Which gradations? Which scale? What, what, what's, what, what kind of scale? How many increments? And incremental scales are not always even. And of course, in the world of describing parts of our lives, they're not even. They're very complex. They're very colorful. And in fact, what you can do is play this little game of reverse engineering this. And you can pick a word and you can actually pour significance into it. And you can work experiences up around it. And you can make it your word to live by, your virtue to live by, or your focus of the month, the thing that you're working with currently. And this can increase your significance, the significance of that word to you. It can increase the meaning for you, and thus therefore increasing what's meaningful to you, and thus increasing meaning. And that's only really one way around it, because... The other way around it is that you have meaningful experiences and you have the experiential side come first and then later afterwards the word is put on top. And when I talk about heavy words, I mean the words that are associated with significant events to you, the powerful events of your life. They're not your everyday words. They're not your words that you use very often. And it might even be if, you, if you're aware of this and you're already in on this game and it's been happening and, and this makes sense to you, then that word becomes something of a, of a trigger. When you hear that word, then it makes a little bit of the experiences surrounding it come up and you're suddenly on edge. And this can't, this can't be the case with everyday words because you hear them over and over again and eventually they become mundane, they become normal, they just become passing words and we all need a degree of that in our lives. We all have a degree of that in our lives. So with this in mind, I'd like to share some heavy words with you from my recent experiences. And I realize that they've been very different. What, what I, how I would have answered this question or what are some heavy words to you at different times in my life would have been different. And in fact, maybe that's a characteristic of a heavy word is that it, it, it has a passing, it has a a peak, and then a dying, and then we move on to something else. But maybe that just depends on how many varieties of experiences we're having and how much we're exploring and how deeply we have each experience. And it's really no, it's not really advice. It's really, I, I don't think I can say, like the whole thing of reverse engineering this and this thing and working it into words and going around with different ideas of what a word is. It's, it, it's sort of philosophical and, and it can work to an extent, but really if we were looking at this, we'd want to do both sides of this, working with the word and reverse engineering it 
and also working with just experiential things. Just things that are experiences first and words later, and significance and meaning is derived later. And all the subcategories of experiences, it might be emotional, it might be a situation, it might be a series of events, it might be an action, it could be a certain perception, And you can create the, the, the whole thing of experientialism as a, as a practice or a branch of awareness techniques is that you're isolating certain components and constructing them in such a way as that they will create this kind of meaning. They'll create a big impact on you. And the easiest way to do that is do something the quickest way to do that is to do something you've never done before. Because when you do something really that you've never done before, then you need to find a new word. You realize you wouldn't be using a word that you've always used. And if you do, if you do happen to say, well, that is this, and this is the word I've always used. I've always known this word. It's always, this word has always been in my vocabulary. But this now has a whole new meaning to me. And there is a difference between reshaping the experiences surrounding a word and having a new word added to your vocabulary. And both can happen. Sometimes you have a brand new experience and then someone comes along and says, well, that's this experience. And you say, wow, that's a new word. What do you call that, Dosta? And I say, well, we call that multidimensional thinking. And you think, wow, is that what that is? And now you're always walking around like I, like I have been at times saying multidimensional thinking, the multidimensional mind. <laughs> And don't walk around with it too long because then it will pass into the mundane. So one word that means something to me of great significance, and it's a word I don't use very often, it's a word that has only very few experiences, but powerful experiences surrounding it, is the word courage. Now, what comes to mind when you think of courage? For me, courage means something like moving on and continuing a fight in the face of adversity. It means bravery. It means facing your fears. It means being in the midst of chaos and yet continuing. That old Self-help cliche quote comes to mind. If you're in hell, keep going. Or, sorry, what is it? If you're going through hell, keep going. Have you heard that one before? And for me, the word courage came to mind when I was in a situation where all things around me were crumbling and things were hurting. And it wasn't just me in that situation. It was also other people. And so many of our fears were brought to our attention. So many of our struggles were immediate. So many of our pains were 
unable to be ignored. And in that moment, there was a moment of realizing that we are stepping up to something, almost like a duty, almost like a bold, heroic act. And courage is something you, is a quality we ascribe to heroes. Courageous. Courageous acts. And a courageous act is very different to being a victim or being selfish or being fearful or being a coward. And really the opposite of courage is cowardice. To run away from the problems, to hide from the problems, to deny the fears, to hide. And so I don't use this word courage very much. And there are only very few situations in this there's this one particular situation where this word courage was born to me. Usually when we have the word courage, it's we come across the word courage, it's not ascribed to us personally. And it's quite rare that anyone would even ever say that. And I don't know if I've ever in my life said that about someone else. That that person showed courage. That person has a lot of courage. Except, of course, in this one situation which I have in mind. Where we were in a group and we were in the war. We were in hell. And I mean, I mean, Metaphorically speaking, there wasn't a, an actual war. <laughs> and in that moment, well, the word courage was born. And the word courage made sense. And it's often actually that we hear these words or we learn these words by hearing other people talk about them, hearing other people say them or different stories, or we read them in books, and so on. And it's quite rare that we get the opportunity to see really the origin of a word. And this, this can be a deeper thing that we can, we can reverse engineer. Now, what's the origin of a word experientially? You know, if you ask a linguist what is the origin of the word, they'll say, well, it's part this Greek and part this Latin from this era, which means this, derivative from this. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about intellectual linguistics. I'm talking about experiential. Now, when, when was the moment when someone was in a war, in the battlefield, and they saw their friend they were fighting alongside their fellow army man, and they saw them do something that took courage, they saw them really show an act of courageousness and they really were the hero of that war. And they came through and they all then looked back and they started talking about what this man did and they started asking themselves, now what's the word for that? And someone says, oh, the word for that is courage. And then they say, well, okay, let's use that word. And of course, that's not how language is born. This is a very crude way of talking about how language is born and how a language evolves. It's much more gradual than that. And there are a whole bunch of things that are factors to the birth of words and the growing of words. But still, in this story, there is something. There is, a, there is an essence to the word courage where... You can say 
deeply that yes, this word fits. Yes, is the this is the correct word for this situation. Encourage means different things to different people. Even the people who were present at this moment where for me the whole meaning took a new depth of this word courage. And in fact, someone, I don't want to share too much. I'd like to keep a bit of privacy here because this is very personal stuff. And this this might be a bit of a tangent, but there is... There is this thing hanging over me in this conversation, which is if I talk too much about these words, they will lose something. Now, I'm, I'm, sp- I'm speaking a line, I'm walking a line here to impart something to you and to still preserve the purity of these words. So if, I fe- if you feel like I'm being mysterious or you should, you're feeling like, just come out with it and say the story, Dosta, well, there's a reason I'm not. And I hope you can respect that. So with that in mind, I'll just say one more thing about the word courage, and that is that a person changed their name to mean courage. They had the name change. And there is a big significance to that. There is a very deep significance to that. So another word, which means a lot to me, is this word fire. And I mean the emotional burn, the emotional fire, the fire within, of course. Like what does fire, what does fire mean normally? Do you mean like we're going to have a campfire? Let me just get comfortable. I'm just moving my things around. I'll have a sip of water as well. But what do you mean fire, Dosta? You mean we're sitting around having a fire or a bushfire? You come from Australia. Australia is famous for its bushfires. Why are you saying fire is a significant word? Did you know someone who was in a bushfire, Dosta? And I say, no, I mean someone who has fire. The fire within. Metaphorically. Raging, burning, heat, passion, drive, uncompromising, clenching fists, storm, these sorts of words, these sorts of feelings. That's what I mean. Determination. Determination is a good one. That's a kind of fire. And someone who has a deep fire is actually someone who's transmuted their anger into drive. So when someone's angry, you normally say, cool down or calm down. This sort of thing. And that's because they've got this fire within them. And if they're angry and they're using it in a non-constructive way, well, they haven't used, to, they haven't found the ability to transmute that energy within them into something positive. Anger is a misguided fire; it's a misguided energy. And there are people that use their anger for creative things, and even for positive things. When someone really has a strong fire, they have a drive. Their action, their actions are driven by emotions. And they can be very productive. They can be very hardworking. They can achieve a lot. They can build a lot. And the list goes on. And it's not that fire is like a fuel and we all have various amounts of it or not and each of us have different amounts of how much we've developed it or made it aware to us or not it's not it's not so much that black and white 
because everyone has their own quality of fire, you realize that flames have different colors. Flames have different temperatures, depending on what's burning, depending on what combustion is taking place. And in fact, the hottest flames, the hottest fire is invisible. The fire of the sun is very different to the fire of your campfire. And it's not to say that one's better or worse. I mean, this is, this is where we delve again into poetry. Because the fire of the suns, the fire of the stars, really is a raging fire. And yet to be sitting on a beach with the sound of the waves and the wind blowing in the night and the stars overhead while a campfire burns with a dim glow of the embers giving off a nice warmth, a comforting warmth. That's a different place to be. And who is it to say that one is better or worse? And I remind you again that we're here to embrace the full varieties of human experience. And fire is a word that comes up probably more often than courage. We have our fire brigade, we have our different fires. We have your fire in your kitchen, if you've got a certain, whatever you use to do your cooking or whatever. So it's funny that when you have significant experiences, it might be that a very simple word is the one, and, and, and even a very common word, a very mundane common word is the right word for it. And to you, you have this thing because of your unique experiences, which is a different meaning to the word. You have this word which is something so different. And it's, and it's quite strange. People might look at you funny. So fire is this inner fire if you can, this is one, well, you can actually look out for. I think people more often understand that. Like, you can understand what emotional fire is. You can start to see it. And if you look around for it, then you can start to build a picture of it. But really, more closer to home, we would say, what, what's your fire? When you've really felt like you're on fire, like, damn, I was on fire, girl. Damn, you are on fire, girl. You are smoking hot, girl. When, it, when is that? When you're in your element. And if you can't think of any of those moments, well, think of when you've been angry. Have you ever been really angry? And it might be that both those things are <laughs> missing. It might be that both of those things, you, you need both in order to build your own understanding or your own experiences around fire. Where is home? You realize this word home is much the same as this word fire in the sense that it can be extremely significant and even existential. And yet it's still a mundane word, it's still a very plain word. And one of the greatest moments in life the very climax of life, the, the peak, the very thing that you were born to do was for you to come home.
And when you come home, there will be a glorious celebration. We will be overflowing with joy. There will be ecstasy for everyone. Just complete rapture. We'll be smiling and dancing and cheering and there'll be cake and we can have a cup of tea and there'll be music and all sorts of things when you come home. And it might be, well, that's so far off and that's so outlandish. Dosta, obviously you're walking around with some wild notion of what home means. And what does it mean to you? And I say, well, I don't mean you're just going to your house. I don't mean you're just going back to your parents' home and that's home. Of course, I mean the existential home. And how you find that is by inquiring into it. What are the characteristics of home? Quite simply, what are the, what are the characteristics? Let's try and make this a little less metaphorical. Well, home is a place you've been before. Home is a place you feel comfortable and safe in. Home is a place you go after a long journey. Home is a place of rest. Home is a place of quiet. Home is also the place with the people that you love, with the people that you trust, with the people that mean something to you and that care for you and you for them. And so if you can say, well, what does it mean to find an existential home? Well, can you come to reality after a long journey? Can you find reality as a place of rest? Can you find reality as a place of comfort and shelter? Can you find a reality which has people that you love and you care and feel safe around? And that inquiry simply is the line into where is home? Home is where the heart is, is the old cliche answer to that. Home is more than just a house, is another cliche catchphrase that goes along in this category. And those cliche answers, well, they are, they are the actual answers to this question. They are the real answers. And it's really up to you to find out, well, where, where is my heart? If home is where the heart is, where is the heart? And you say, well, it's in my chest and I can put my hand on it now. And well, there it is. Boom, boom, boom. Just pat yourself on the chest. That's where home is. And that's the equivalent of saying, well, Home is just up the street. I'll give you the address. Here's my house. Go say hello. Go and have a cup of tea with my parents. <laughs> I don't know if I would want to have a cup of tea with your parents, to be honest. It could be a little bit awkward. <laughs> so, for me, when a significant event happened, then... I said, well, that was like my coming home. And I've known people who've quite literally answered this question, where, where, where is home for you? And they've said, well, I'm always home. The world is my home. And of course, for that to be a conversation which has meaning, well, then there's got to be a trust between the two people having that conversation. Because it can be that you're actually just making small talk and you say, oh, where, where do you live? Where's your home? 
and then the other person is trying to be all mysterious and all profound. And they say, the whole world is my home. And you think, oh, that's very good, but how am I going to visit you on Wednesday? But then there is an understanding between people, and you can go into meaningful conversations. And it doesn't have to be like this conversation here where we're having very long-winded philosophical discussions which go through all different permutations and multiple definitions. It might just be a very short conversation where there is a deep connection and a meaningful understanding between the two people. And they say, one says to the other, where is home? And that other person says, more and more each day I'm feeling like this whole world is my home. And the profundity is understood. The profundity is conveyed. What does harmony mean to you? And this is one of those musical terms, and really all musical terms. Like if we take the components of music, like rhythm, timbre, harmony, tone, structure, instrumentation, and so on, so forth, that we can use any of those as a profound thing or a metaphorical thing. But really, recently I've liked this word harmony, particularly when we're talking about the body, when we're talking about the physical body, and we can actually also talk about the emotional body and the energetic body. Harmony still applies to those as well. But like if we just stick with the physical body, then there's a harmony that can be achieved in the physical body. And what does that mean? Well, quite literally, harmony is multiple parts working together in a way that is pleasing. Now in music, if you have one note, and that's a single note, it's just by itself. But if we then play a note after that note, then we have a melody. And if we string notes one after the other in a succession, then we have a melodic line. And harmony comes into it when we add another note at the same time as any of these notes in this melodic line. And then we can add another note to another note. And we have not just one string of a melody, one line of a melody, but two lines of a melody. And then we can add another line, and we can have three lines. And we can say, well, they're voices. These are the voices of the choir. Or this is the instrumentation. One can be a trumpet, one can be a trombone, one can be a saxophone. And this is harmony. And how harmonious it is, is how it feels to have these notes flow along. And if you study music harmony, you know that there's a very, there's a whole universe in just that, which is how many different notes and combinations there are, which one goes after another one. And there are principles such as tension and release. And you can say, well, for these first few notes, things become chaotic. There's a dissonance. And I don't like the sound. It's a very bad harmony. Bad harmony. Not good harmony. I don't like this harmony. And then as it goes on, it resolves and it becomes very soft and very simple and very clear and very easy. And you say, ah, nice harmony, very soft harmony, very nice. 
I like very much this harmony. But of course, you know, there's the principle of contrast, and that's what's happening in this tension and release. And the whole reason it felt so nice is because you had the tension and the darkness, the dissonance beforehand. And that's just one principle of harmony. There are many principles, as well as many theories and, and math and histories. And it's a whole, it's really just a whole universe. And there's so many, com it's an infinite complex, an infinite complexity, music harmony. So as that applies to the body, well, you've got parts of the body, like how your head moves. How your head is moving is one line. Does your head move suddenly? Does it move a lot? Where does it sit on your neck? Where does it sit? Does it feel heavy on your shoulders? How often does it move and what makes it move? What sort of expressions does it have? What sort of expressions make it move? What kind of head nodding or head shaking do you do when you're having a conversation or otherwise? And that's one line. And then you can say, well, there's also how your feet walk. How do your ankles move? Are you double weighted? Are you evenly weighted? Do you walk fast? Do you walk slow? And you see that between your head and your feet, your head nodding and your feet walking, there's a coordination. These are two lines. And this is what dancing is. The, the, the equivalent is, well, dance. Dance is look like the musical equivalent. And I'm not talking just about dance. I'm talking even more broadly about just the use of the body in your whole life. And one of the things you can work on, harmony, the harmony of your body, is to learn dance. And quite literally, you're harmonizing the parts of your body with music. <laughs> so you're learning music, harmony, and the harmony of the body. <laughs> and it also goes not just for the movement of the parts of the body. It's also the feeling. Because you realize now, as you are right now, there are things that you feel more acutely. There are parts in you that you feel more acutely than others. Just take a quick check right now and say, where in your body... Are you the le you feel the least? Just t take a moment to say, which part in you can you not feel? Which you're unaware of. And take your time, really look around, really listen to your body. And you can contrast that bit, which is hard to notice, with the bit that is the most prominent. So if you have a twinge in your neck, or you have a, an injury or something, then that most likely would be the most prominent experience of your body at the moment. And then there's also the most sensitive parts, so your mouth and your fingertips they might be the most prominent. And between these two, there's a harmony, there's a coordination of what you feel the most and what you don't feel. Your awareness and your unawareness, or your acute and your obtuse. And you can work with harmonizing those. And you can polarize them, you can even them out and you can learn to, co you can coordinate them by making them all the same. And coordination doesn't just mean oneness, it means coordination. It might mean that you, you keep different parts out of your awareness and you only focus in on certain parts or you accentuate certain parts in a feeling wise.
And there are many examples. The, the, the body is, well, the body is as rich as music harmony in that there are many principles and there are also many components and there are also many theories and practices that you can do to create harmony in it. So body harmony and music harmony share a direct correlation. And then there's also harmony as applied to life. Really, really this word harmony can be applied to so many things. So it's not perhaps quite like the word fire or the word courage, which is quite rare, and fire, which has its own definition or its unique definition surrounding experiences. And harmony is more like sort of a, it can be, I guess, a psychological principle or a driving principle behind your practices or the sort of things you want to do. And if you say, well, listening to you speak, I believe that harmony is a good thing and I want to get involved in that. So I'm going to learn music harmony or I'm going to learn to dance. I'm going to learn some dance classes. I'm going to do some dance classes. And dance is just one example. And we'll, we've, talked, we've talked so much about the, the body and how to harmonize it. So I won't spend too much time on it. But also what I was getting at just before was, well, there's life harmony. So the harmony of your actions and your, well, your digestions and your thoughts. Like what does harmony mean in the mind? And what does harmony mean in relationships? And what does harmony mean with appreciating nature? And what does harmony mean with perceptions? What does harmony mean with emotions? And continue the list. The list goes on. And now we come to silence. Silence is a heavy word. Well, it's a word that signifies something heavy, I should say, more accurately. So what does silence mean to you? Have you ever inquired into silence? Have you spent much time listening to silence? <laughs> And really, the, the deepest realization I have, I'll just share it quickly with you now, is that the whole world is in silence. Do you realize that? This planet, this planet Earth of our local solar system Milky Way, is floating in silence. And always there is more silence than there is sound. Even in the most noisy situations, there, there is always silence wherever you go. Because silence is the context and noise, sound, is the content. So if only we could ever always hear the silence of every situation. And that's something I've been working with. And I don't want to say too much about it. Because, well, like I've said, it's personal. And I'm by no means saying I've gone all the way. Silence is a, well, silence is a journey. Silence is something you not only inquire into and remind yourself of, but it's a experiential thing that you build up within yourself. And it's between your relationship. It's between your, it's, it's in your relationship between you and life. And just try and wrap your head around that the whole world is in silence.
And now we come to one which is actually quite often used in a unique sense. And it's used in a profound way. It's almost always used in a profound way. When we talk about this word, or when we talk about this thing, it's quite easy to make it into a profound conversation. And that is freedom. And this is something that all the sages and speakers talk about, the spiritual gurus talk about, is that they're fighting for mankind's freedom. This is something quite famously Krishnamurti said when someone asked him what he was doing. He said, well, he didn't say he was fighting, and I don't know the exact quote, but in, but in essence what he was saying is he's, he's working for the freedom of humanity. And freedom really is, it's one of those things that's so far off, so far removed from just our daily life because we think, okay, I read this book by Krishnamurti and, well, he's obviously some sort of genius guru or big thinker or big mind or enlightened guy and, okay, well, I have to get my routine, I have to go to the shops, I have to find out how to get a job, how to get some money and I have just my day-to-day -day petty sort of, well, not petty, but they're, they're just day-to-day -day mundane things that I'm working on. And you think, well, how is that connected to freedom? If I really just had a, had a good job with good pay, then I'd be free. I'd be financially free. Yes, financial freedom. That's what I need. But really, of course, he was talking about something much deeper than that. He was talking about an absolute freedom, an existential freedom. And we can turn freedom into a whole bunch of psychological nuances and do philosophical hair-splitting on it. We can say freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of location, freedom of ability, freedom of feelings, freedom of imagination, freedom of relationships, free sex, free happiness, free grace, free salvation, free fulfillment, freedom to do and be whatever you want to be, and so on and so forth. And then really we can come along and say, well, there's got to be an ultimate freedom, right? The freedom of knowing yourself, the freedom of existence, the freedom of realizing God. So even in this category of ultimate freedom, we can do philosophical hair splitting. <laughs> Seems Sometimes I wonder if that's just something, that's just a habit, this philosophical hair splitting that I do. And Well, it's just a matter of filling out the ideas. I'm just trying to illustrate the ideas by fluffing it out. And freedom of, of autonomy or freedom of awareness, well, that's a, that's a big one, isn't it? Those are two things that even within those, like, well, how do we def define this freedom of awareness? Well, it might be intensity. It might be varieties. It might be perception. It might be memory. It might be self-realization. It might be insight. And if we do the same with freedom of autonomy, well, we can say that you can make your own decisions, you can do what you want, you can choose your own actions, you can move your body how you want. Can you change the temperature of your body? Can you change the strength and endurance of your body? Can you change the ability of your body? And so on. So within freedom, there's a lot. And for me, freedom is, is, is a heavy word, but... Very much not like courage or fire or home or harmony in that I don't have I don't have powerful experiences around it that's driving my appreciation and the, the significance of it for me. It's much it's still more intellectual and it's still more of something that I, I wish I should I, I wish I would hold up my own reverence 
towards it more. I'm or I'm my own sincerity, I should say, towards it. So freedom is one that well, I, I don't really have a a story or a personal moment where that came up for me. And yet still, I, I'm well, I guess this means that we're both in the same boat on this, is that we're sort of reverse engineering this word and saying, okay, we know that Krishnamurti talked about it and we can do these philosophical complexities to it. But in essence, what we really want to say is just keep that as a sort of true north or something to work with, something to work towards. And really consider what that means. Consider how that can affect our choices in what to do or where to go or what we're paying attention to. And if we are caught up in with, well, I need a job, I need to get groceries, I need to get some money, I need to do my day, day-to-day day thing, then, well, let's just remember freedom and then maybe that will factor into how much weight we give to the mundane things. And now we come to the last word that I'd like to talk about today in this conversation. The last one that makes the current list that I've got floating around in me of heavy words. And that is this word beauty. And Beauty is, well, you say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is relative. And my answer to that has been, well, actually, you only say beauty is relative up until the point where you've experienced the most beautiful thing that life has to offer. And then you say, well, that is the most beautiful thing. And you can still maintain that, well, maybe it's different for someone else. (laughs) But I choose to say that this is the most beautiful thing. This is the absolute beauty. And your experience should be so powerful that it brings you to tears. That it makes you start bawling your eyes out. And you're just overflowed with joy and gratitude. And thanks that you've been able to experience something so beautiful. And that is a very rare moment that is as rare as courage and it's one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had the most intense experiences I've had and I am very grateful I am very lucky to have had that experience And I realize that in another sense, well, beauty is this word that's always been around. And it's so funny how it's changed. And my answer to this question, well, what what is beautiful or what what is beauty? That sounds very philosophical and it's it's a bit tricky, like there's no real way around it when we're talking, when using words, because we can say, what is beauty? And then we can divulge into a philosophical conversation. Or we can say, what is beautiful to you? And then we can have a personal conversation. And you can tell me your story. And then you'll say something, well, well, you know, I had this time when these people were here and this happened. 
or this moment occurred when I was doing this in this situation and there's a story surrounding it. And if you're really good at telling the story, then there's also an emotion behind it and I'll get a sense of it when you tell that story. But then we can also look at your personal evolution of this word beauty and we can say, well, what, what did you think beauty was before that moment? Would you ever have said that something was the most beautiful thing in your life before then? And maybe not. It might be, that might be part of the realization, which is that you're remembering this word and you're really, you're really discovering this word for the first time. And you have something so shocking and so profound that you say, wow, yes, now this is the word I want to use, beauty. And it might be then that you stop using that word for certain things. Ah, this cup of tea is beautiful. And you say, well, no, that doesn't quite fit anymore. I don't really want to say that for my cup of tea. I want to say, this cup of tea is very nice. Something else. And really, that's that. Part of the reverse engineering is to say, well, let, let's try and do that same principle with all our words, and we'll just speak truth. You've heard that before. Say what's real. Use words correctly for what they are. Now that's one thing, and that can help to build meaning. But that's very different to saying, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find. I'm going to make beauty a thing that I'm, it's a treasure that I'm looking for. I'm going to find an experience which really fits this word beauty. And I'm going to keep searching and building and working and whatever it takes until I really know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is beauty. This is the most beautiful thing in the world. And that's very different to just walking around and saying, well, I, want, I just won't use the word beauty until I really find something that's truly beautiful. And I'll stop saying that my cups of tea are beautiful. Because in that scenario, you might not ever find the most beautiful thing. It might not, it might not stumble upon its way. You might just be stuck in the mundane. You might just be stuck with a collection of everyday normal words and you don't you don't have this category at all of heavy words words that when you hear them when even when you hear someone else speak them they cause something to stir in you and if you really talk about them and something opens up and you start to relive these intense experiences. But instead, we just have normal, every day to day life because we just concern ourselves with petty things. And we don't go on the quest for beauty. And we don't ask ourselves, what is my inner fire? And we don't walk through hell. And realize that in that moment, it's going to take courage, real courage, to keep walking. And it's a bit of a leap to hear something like harmony, music harmony, and to learn music harmony. And to apply that to life and to existence. It's quite possible to be very good at music harmony. Brilliant, even a genius. You can be a genius at music harmony and yet never have made the connection that you need harmony within your body, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your being, your life and existence.
And of course there's depths to silence which are untold. And that is a solitary journey. And when it comes to freedom, well, <laughs> you and me are probably in the same boat. Maybe you've gone further on the journey towards freedom than me. <laughs> I have inner freedoms. I have freedom of imagination. And I still have my external world to, my, my mundane life to, <laughs> to work with. It's a very humble life at the moment, <laughs> is all I can say. And of course, I'm not forgetting home. And just remember that if you, re if you keep it in mind and you go on the journey, there will be a point in life where you come home. And once you know where home is, you'll always know where it is. So if it's comfortable for you to do so, stop what you're doing. Sit down somewhere quietly and just close your eyes. And try to sense some of the words that you've heard here today. And see which ones stick out for you. It might not even be the ones I've intended to. It might be that you have your own words of significance. Words with weight to them. So inquire into them and notice them and listen to them. Feel free to recall memories that surround them. Feel free to ask yourself why certain words are significant to you. And just sit quietly for a few minutes and that's all I have to say for now <laughs>